Hello there, THP 494 and 598. All right, it is that time again. We are going to sit down and take a look at what it takes to get multiple processes to talk to one another. And we're going to look at what that means first locally, and then once we get a handle on how we're actually working with communication locally, we're then going to take a step uh, and divide that into two processes that will still be local. And then finally, we'll look at a very specific use case example of what that's going to mean when we're dealing with the communication between something uh, like, for example, Touch OSC and Touch Designer, and how we uh, start to think about how we build systems that talk to one another and send information back and forth. So that's where we're headed today. We're going to break it up into a couple different sections. So don't worry. Hopefully this will be like three videos long, and that will cover everything that we're going to talk about. So with no further ado, let's dive in here. All right, so first things first, let's go ahead and... Um, go to the root of our project and let's just go ahead and junk uh, our standard project here because what we need to do is we need to add two bases to our network. Um, let's add one and let's add a second. So what we're going to start to do is we're going to start to look at how we communicate between places without using selects. And specifically, we're going to start to think about communication where we're talking across a network uh, or we're talking to different processes on the same machine. And this becomes really useful if we start to think about how we run larger distributed systems and how we talk to people that are running other kinds of applications. Uh, so there are lots of different ways that we might take advantage of this. There are lots of uh, advantages this might have for us, right? And we're just going to start to dig in here to the fundamentals of how we start to understand that particular idea. So here on the left, we're going to call this send. And here on the right, we're going to call this receive. And from now on, right, this video is going to be a little bit weird because we really are going to live in two different spaces. On the left here, we're going to be um, dealing with this send base. And on the right here, we're going to be dealing with our receive base. Uh, and it's important to draw that distinction because we really are going to be in two different places practically as we start to think about this. And it'll be really important to kind of hold that in our minds and really kind of uh, dig into what that means and how we can take advantage of that. Uh, so for starters here, let's go ahead and uh, think about what it's going to take to make some things uh, that we might actually want to send across a network. Um, so typically we think about uh, how we route that. That's a, a wonderful way that we kind of dig into what those particular things mean. And there are lots of other kinds of ways that we uh, might want to start with this, right? Like there are lots of different things I might want to send across the network. I might want to send images. I might want to send uh, floats, integers. I might want to send messages. Uh, and an important question for us to address is what are my options and where can I get started? So um, we've got a wonderful set of operators that exist in the touch in and out operators. And we're going to start with those first before we move on to something, uh, anything that's a little more open-ended. So to get started, let's go ahead and let's first draw a circle because we're going to start with the tops uh, as a way of thinking about how we do this. And I'm going to take the circle, I'm going to make it a polygon, and then I'm going to set it to rotate abs time dot frame. So it just kind of continually spins here. I want something that's always moving. Great. And now I'm going to think about how I'm going to get that from one place to another. Now, if I was just in the same network, uh, and granted, I am in the same network, but I'm really starting to think about how does this work um, when I'm spread out across multiple machines or multiple processes, I need to start to think about what I have at my disposal to make that happen. So in this case, I'm going to go to my handy dandy uh, touch out. Now, this operator is specifically designed to help me communicate across the network and across machines. So we can see here that I'm bound to network port 9000. Over here on the right hand side, we're going to go ahead and add, and add a touch in. So our touch in over here, and let's bring up our parameters. This is bound to the same network port, and I'm on the IP address that's localhost. So that's great. So you can see here, right, that I'm sending this image back and forth. And we could imagine, right, that if these were separate machines, I could actually send this across the network. Now, of course, I'm going to run into some limits in terms of what that means um, when it comes to bandwidth and how much information I can actually send across the network, right? I've got lots of, or at least have a option in terms of what that means in terms of how I compress that or don't compress that. Uh, I can certainly make that active or inactive. So there are lots of kind of uh, details that uh, we could certainly get lost in for right now. 
what I want us to really think about is the fact that this is a, a kind of starter for how we can send information uh, using network protocols between machines. So not only is it important for us to think about how this um, works as a set of operators, I want us to pay close attention to our network ports. So let's go ahead and add another touch out. And let's go ahead and set this to be uh, port 9011. And we're going to make a little more room here. And over here, we're going to add another. We can actually just copy and paste this touch in. Let's go ahead and look at 9011. We can see that we're not sending anything yet. So I'm going to take this same circle. I'm going to uh, middle mouse click here. I'm going to add a blur, right? So I'm going to fork this. And I'm going to change this operator in some way, right? So I'm just going to go ahead and crank the blur way up on this. So I have something that's really blown out. And then I'm going to pass this to my touch out. We might just have to reset our active status. Great. And now we can see that lo and behold, now I'm sending another image, right? And in this case, I'm using another network port. So in this case, I'm 9000. And in this case, I'm 9011. So this is great because it means that I'm not stuck with a single stream, right? Depending on the strength of my network and uh, what the circumstances of what that actually round out to being, I have the ability to send multiple images across the network. All right. So let's look at what else we have access to. So certainly we have access to TOPS. Well, what other kinds of ins and outs do we have? In CHOPS, we also have touch outs here. So a touch out here is going to have a similar kind of uh, setup, right? So let's go ahead and let's add maybe some noise so we can see this move across the network. So I'm going to drop in a noise chop here. I'm going to go ahead and give it multiple channels. So I'm going to go ahead and assign it uh, the names Chan 1 through 5. And let's time slice that so we can see it move a little bit. Excellent. So with my touch out, I can see that I'm on network port 8000. Excellent. I can see that the protocol that I'm using is TCP IP, which is excellent. Over here on the received side, I'm going to drop in a touch in. I'm going to make sure that I'm set to localhost as my address. My network port is 8000, so we should, with any luck here, um, we should be able to see these talk to one another. And sure enough, that is actually happening. Now, certainly one of the things that we have to start to think about is uh, what's the lag that's involved, right? What's the latency that I have to think about? Because certainly there's latency where we're going to talk across um, wires, right? And these are physical wires. In the case of a local, locally hosted network, there are no physical wires that um, kind of stretch out over long spans. But if we had a long distributed system of multiple computers, we would certainly have to start to think about, well, what are the solutions and what are the problems that we need to tackle in order to address how we futz with that? And that's into the weeds a little bit for us here. Um, that's certainly important. Um, but not totally within the scope of what I want us to kind of grapple with, which is just the kind of nuts and bolts of how we start to think about making this work. So we might also pay attention to the fact here that we can uh, also, with our touch in and out, we can use multiple ports. So let's go ahead and grab our touch out here. Let's add another address, 8011. Uh, let's here, let's select out of this. And let's select just a single channel. So in fact, I'm just going to go ahead and grab uh, maybe Chan 3. I'm going to change the address I'm listening to over here, 8011. And sure enough, there we have just Chan 3 that's getting sent over the network. So this is excellent. This is a wonderful way for us to see that not only can we send tops, we can also send chops across um, the network. And you guessed it, we can also send dats. So here, let's add a table. And in our table, let's go ahead and edit this, um, because we can imagine a circumstance where we might have um, some settings that live in uh, one application, right? So we might have hue, saturation, bright. And let's abbreviate these. 
hue, sat, bright. We might have black level. And these might also have values that are associated with them and probably, in fact, they probably would. 1.0, 1.0, 0.5, 0.0. Excellent. If we attach this to a touch out, again, we're going to pay special, or we're going to pay close attention, rather, here to our network address, so 9500, and a touch in. And lo and behold, there it is, or right across. So while we're here, let's go ahead and just quickly, uh, let's change some of these values. So if I made this, for example, 0 0.8, or 10.8, pardon me, or even 0 0.8, we can see that those values push right across the network. Now we're not limited, of course, to tables, right? We might also think about um, other ways that we could communicate. So let's again change our address here, 9511, 9511. And let's add just a text top instead. Lovely. And so we can see here that we could send um, full long strings of text in addition to sending table information. Excellent. So we can start to imagine lots of ways that this might be really useful uh, or interesting especially in larger distributed systems, where it's important for me to think about how I separate processes. So these are our class of touch ins and outs. Uh, and these are really going to be handy for us in lots of different kinds of ways, right? We, we might imagine even a scenario, um, which is not too difficult to imagine, I don't think, where we had something, we had one machine uh, that was doing some complex uh, geometry rendering, right? So if we had a sphere, for example, let's take our sphere and let's add some noise. Uh, we might do our handy dandy trick that we frequently do where we convert that then to a dot. We might want to send that across the network with a touch out. Let's go ahead and make sure that our addressing is correct here. So this is 9511. Let's give this one the address 9512. 9511, 9512. Excellent. All right, so we can see that sure enough, we're sending all of that point information uh, this way right across our network. Excellent. All right, we're gonna go ahead and just turn down the complexity of this just like a skosh. And then we might take this and we might imagine a scenario where we're doing some rendering over here, right? So we might have a camera, a piece of geometry. A light. We might be rendering this particular thing. Let's use our geo and turn our scale back down. And we could take this and then apply it is all the information for our instance. So now we're dealing with actually how we're processing and generating the noise here. We're sending all of that point information over the network, and then we're actually doing the instance rendering here in another process. That's just one example of a way that we might use this. And again, this depends on what our distribution of hardware looks like in a given situation or a given venue. All right. So certainly not touch ins and outs are our only options. What are some of the other options that we have access to in terms of thinking about how to wrestle with this very complex problem? Well, while we're at it, why don't we go ahead and look at our OSC? our open sound control uh, communication methods. So I'm going to go ahead and use a select, and I'm going to go ahead and reuse this noise that we've already generated. So we don't have to worry about anything else that we're going to pass around here. So on the left, I have an OSC out. On the right, I'm going to add an OSC in. And here we have another way 
of now sending this information across the network. Great, we've gone ahead and given an address here of 1212 and 1212 just to make sure that we're not competing with anything. And lo and behold, we can see that we're passing that information, right? Over here, um, via open sound control between these two processes. So what then is the difference between uh, touch in, touch out, and uh, OSC? Well, open sound control gives us the option to communicate to a lot of different kinds of platforms that aren't just touch designer specific. So we could talk to any number uh, of applications that rely on open sound control uh, as a method of uh, kind of standardizing that communication process. And open sound control is really about UDP packets that are sent across the network and how we structure those UDP messages in a way that allows us to reliably um, communicate information between applications. And we can kind of understand that a little more clearly if in addition to our OSC in as a chop, we add an OSC in dat. And we're going to go ahead and set these to have the same uh, port, so 12, 12. And here we can see the formatting of that message. I'm going to pause this for just one second. And we can see here that we have a header that tells us our sample rate. We also have subsequent headers that tell us our channel numbers, so slash chan1. That corresponds over here to slash chan1. And then the value that's associated with that. And this chunk of information, right, chan1 through chan5, this is actually all a list of information that we're sending. And that will make more sense here in just one moment, I'm sure at least I hope. Uh, but here we can see how this process is actually being formatted as it's passing back and forth across the network. So there's actually some header information. There's a kind of package uh, of data that's then passed um, between these processes. And it has a very specific format. And the format allows us uh, to understand or to know how we're going to talk, uh, talk between different kinds of machines. It's a protocol, really, right? Open sound control is a way of thinking about how we send information or send uh, triggers back and forth uh, and messages back and forth between computers. And this is platform agnostic, so we can deal with um, you know, Macs and PCs living on the same network and using OSC as a way to talk between them. In fact, we're not really limited to just uh, Macs or PCs. It could be Macs, PCs, uh, Linux. Uh, we could use Raspberry Pis. We could use and Raspberry Pis are really, you know, they use a, a Linux uh, base, right? Um, but we could use lots of different protocols uh, and operating systems that have this standardized method of how we actually send and communicate that information. Okay, so certainly we can do that with chops. So then how do we do that with dats? And we've got an OSC out dat, but this does not behave in quite the same way as uh, the other operators that we've looked at up until this point. So here, if I was to say, uh, for example, attach a text dat to this OSC out. Now, Similar to our um, touch ins and outs, we might anticipate that I could simply just write a message in here and that it should certainly, oops, I need an OSC in over here, excuse me, OSC in, that it should just populate this. And in fact, let's make sure that we're uh, broadcasting and listening to the same place. Excellent. OSC out and let's um, make sure that we're listening to port 7000. Great. Lovely. So we might imagine that for whatever reason that this should just work and it just doesn't seem to. So how do we actually take advantage of this? Well, we actually need to put together our message um, uh, as a package, right? As an OSC formatted piece of information. So let's look at how we could do that. Uh, so first, uh, first things first, uh, we typically want to send a list of information uh, as a message. So let's go ahead and make a simple little list here, right? And the first thing that we'll do is we'll just put a single float inside of our list. And I'm going to call my list message. Next, we're going to look for the operator that's called OSC out to. That's this operator right here. And then we're going to use the message, or send the, use the method, excuse me, send OSC, all capital letters. 
Next, we need to provide a header. So in my case, I'm going to take use slash as the first portion of that header, and then I can name this anything. So I might do slash mat. And then, uh, with a comma separated here, I need to tell, uh, I need to include the message that I want to send. So I'm wanting to send this message. So now that I have this formatted correctly, I should be able to right click, run my script, and see this inf information passed over here to my OSCN. Now, I'm not limited to just one item in this list. I could build uh, a list uh, just about as long as I want within some reasonable limits, right? Uh, so let's start to think about what other things I might put in here. So I might put other floats. I might put integers. I could even put in strings here into this as well. And now sending this, lo and behold, I've sent all of that information. Now, I'm certainly not limited to this, right? I could at the same time uh, do something like this. I might, for example, um, decide that fruit is going to be its own list. So fruit contains apple, kiwi, and orange. And what I want to do is instead of sending apple, I want to send fruit. And we'll see now that when I run this script that I've actually now sent this whole list of information as well. So we can see how I can start to package information that gets passed across the network based on this kind of uh, protocol, right? This method for how we communicate information across the network. Now there's uh, lots of things that we might learn about how to do this, right? So we could certainly use the wiki as a resource uh, for looking at how we send and receive information here, right? So again, we can see how we've uh, put together vowels as a full list and then we're sending that in this particular method, right? We can see other ways that we might send messages. Um, so again, this is a, a kind of starter, right? This kind of gets the ball rolling as we start to think about how this particular process works and how we can take advantage of it. Now you might say, gosh, that is that is all well and good, but it seems like an awful lot of work. Uh, and it's certainly a different kind of work. Um, but this is something that we're going to actually look at a very practical example of how it works here in just one moment. Well, actually, probably more like three shakes, not just two shakes. Sorry, we've got to do one other thing first. OK, so with all of that in mind, we can see here, kind of we'll pull back, we'll take a glance. We can see how we've started to do this whole process of setting up information on one base that's then sending over to another base. In this case, we're not using either selects um, or wires to connect anything. We're just doing this uh, with different network communication tools. All right, that is all well and good, but please, Matthew, tell me that there is uh, something more to be learned about that, and I promise there is, and it is coming here in our next installment. So hang tight as we start to look at what this means when we run multiple applications simultaneously.